Okay, we're on. Okay, so uh, foil to everyone. Um, this is going to be quite a personal session for all of us, I think, because everyone on this stage um, at some point in our careers has had to leave Ireland or at least leave our communities to find work. Um, and as I constantly remind my children, there is another part of Ireland outside of Dublin. Um, their mother is a culture. And so when Mairead kindly asked me to do this session, it was, um, it was a real honor and a privilege because it's an area I feel very passionate about. So our session is called Corporate to Country. And uh, in many respects, it, it feels like it's describing my own life because I've spent all my life um, until recently when I joined AIR as the Chief Human Resource Officer um, in corporate America, driving employment into Ireland. Um, but frustrated as hell as someone who um, lives and, and comes from uh, County Cork, that many of those opportunities were, were urban based. Um, so today's session is really talking about how we can drive towards creating value added employment opportunities in our rural communities. And I've got a great panel, uh, Denise O'Callaghan from uh, Denise's Gluten Free Bakery, uh, Eleanor Mead from the Mead Potato Company, um, and last but not least, uh, Ronan Byrne, uh, otherwise known as the Friendly Farmer, um, who will, by the way, at the end of this session today, ladies, if you're in the audience, be taking orders for his wonderful organic turkeys. We've already signed up. So that's Christmas dinner taken care of. So one of the things I just wanted to say was I actually, although I work for AIR and I'm largely based out of our headquarters in Dublin, I spend every weekend in a very small rural community uh, called Lorak on the Beira Peninsula. And I personally see every single week the challenges that that community has in keeping our young people at home. Um, and I recently had to describe to a colleague in Dublin what an American wake was. And I started by saying an American wake is every rural Irish mother's worst nightmare because it is the moment when you say goodbye to your children and sometimes they're going very far away. Now with the onset of technology, they're not as far away as they used to be. They don't leave and you never see them again. But I'm a mother, I have two sons, one of them is working abroad, and it is the hardest thing to watch as you meet local women and local men who've just said goodbye to their child. So this fair is extremely important to us as a country and as a community. It's very fashionable nowadays to talk about rural regeneration, but this fair is actually putting practical steps in place to bring employment to the many, many young people um, who I've had the pleasure to meet this morning. Um, and Open Air is very passionate about that. As a company, Air has been involved for 60, 70 years now uh, in local communities all over Ireland. And it's been wonderful this morning meeting some of um, our own recently hired apprentices, but also announcing um, 50 new jobs this year for further apprenticeships which is a program will continue for the next five years. So it's been really great to meet the people who will potentially be in your local communities over the next five years, bringing um, 21st century broadband capability, which brings so many opportunities to communities, to businesses, um, and not least to um, some of our older citizens who now leverage the technology probably better than some of us. So without delay, I'd like to ask Ronan to share his early story with us um, prior um, maybe to leaving um, his mammy, who we've talked about a lot this morning, by the way, and I want to make sure that if Ronan's mammy is listening in on the internet, that he has mentioned you several times already this morning. So I want to talk about that. So Ronan. I don't think I'll ever be able to get away from my mammy somehow. No, <laughs> I, it's just great looking around here because I recognize myself and all the young faces walking around. Um, if an event like this happened maybe 10, 15 years ago, I would have been here to see all the young people in the crowd and the young people walking around up from the schools and from the colleges because um, there's a massive hunger in people from rural Ireland to remain in rural Ireland. And there's a massive hunger in a lot of people to uh, be involved in the agricultural industry. So. A show like this or an exhibition like this is a um, brilliant idea. Um, and that's why it's so well attended, because there's a latent demand there for people to live locally and work locally. Like, it's madness to think that I did it. It was in the teeth of the height of the Celtic Tiger. I got the degree, and uh, there was a suit and tie put on me. 
shipped up to Dublin, sat in front of a recruiter, and the recruiter told me to tell the person that was hiring me that I was highly analytical and highly numerical, and I'm neither. So I ended up getting a job in the Financial Services Centre for six months, and I was like a bull in a china shop. Um, and I used to go across every day to the, and buy the, the, the Farmer's Journal of uh, Thursday and be sitting down in the canteen in the Far Financial Services Centre reading the Farmer's Journal. So there was something not really right with that, uh, with that scene. So since I've been four or five, I've always wanted to be a farmer. I've always wanted to work locally. I think it's more been, been able to work locally. Um, so the opportunity came up then after the Financial Services Centre to go to Poland to manage a dairy farm. And I managed a dairy farm out there for three years, uh, three and a half years. And all that was in my head at the time was, how do I get home? And, um, or how do I get something on this scale at home? Or how do I get something on this scale where I can actually make a living? Because it's drummed into you, um, maybe not so much now, but it was drummed into us that you can't make a living from farming and that you can't make a living from food. And that never sat well with me. That always used to drive me demented. Um, and the penny dropped one day. We had, um, I was living in rural Poland, about 70 kilometers from Warsaw in 2004. There was horses and carts still on the road. There was people on bicycles getting the bar of a bike to a disco. And we had savage broadband in the place where I was living. Fantastic broadband. The quickest broadband actually I've ever had. We'll get you faster soon. <laughs> Yeah, something would, be, would want to be done. So I was on the internet. I had no television, but I was on the internet all the time. And of course, I was researching food and I was researching um, jobs at home, whatever. And I stumbled across a book that told me that in your lifetime and in my lifetime, everybody will eat 550 whole chickens. And we have a bit of land. We have 30 acres. So I set about, we set up a business of uh, rearing chickens and selling them direct to the customer. Um, and that's really how I got back home. We started that business off really small, and we've built it up over eight, nine years now. We employ about five or six people part-time, some of them full-time. And we have a buzz going in the place. And hopefully, as time goes on, it'll keep getting better and better, and we'll be able to employ more people. And like it can be done, but it takes a, it takes a lot. You need to be stubborn as a mule to do it, because uh, things aren't there. Like The lack of broadband is one thing. Um, and the sense that it can't be, can't be done, but it's, it's, it can be done once the mentality is right. That's really my story. That's how I, how I ended up here. And we'll come back to you on the next chapter of your story in a minute. So, Eleanor. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I suppose my story is one a un little bit unlike um, your own, is the fact that the family business was already started. Uh, I would have been part of it. My father began growing new seeds in Queens in the mid 70s. So it was all about potatoes in our family. Um, that's a, all I ever knew about was trying to fill that ton box and get that 10 pound. <laughs> it took a long time. Um, but I suppose for me, maths was always something I loved uh, when I was at school and when I went through secondary school. I came to fifth year and I applied to get into work experience, to get into a bank or a solicitor's or whatever. And I was lucky to secure two weeks uh, work experience in my local bank. And I, for young people out there, I can't stress it enough to get out there, get your work experience, do your week or your two weeks for free and make an impression when you do that work experience because no job should be too small and your, all these small jobs only lead to big jobs. So the two weeks work experience in the bank in the summer when I was 16 led to four summers in the bank and coming to a crossroads in my life where I was being offered a full-time position in, in the bank I'm on or 10 minutes going left. to college. So thankfully, we we're going to be working long enough all our lives, take the three, the four years out to do your degree. I was very glad I did it. Uh, it was probably an easy thing to take the money and work full-time when all my friends didn't have it. But I went to college, I went to Dundalk Institute of Technology. I did a three year Bachelor of Arts degree in accounting and finance, got my honors degree, and there was, at that time, there was an opportunity to do a one year add-on course for the last five exams of an accountancy. 
So I actually took that year out and did that, and I was very lucky to have all of my accountancy exams done at the age of 22. But I was in the unfortunate situation where I was a qualified accountant, but I didn't have any experience. So from that day on, I started in a local practice um, and began working my way up. I spent seven years working in that accountancy practice and loved every minute of it from tax to audit to whatever, it was really what I loved doing. But when you grow up in a family business, when uh, business has been talked at breakfast, at dinner, at tea, you're kind of immune and somehow always drawn back to that family business. So I think in my heart of hearts, I knew I'd probably go back at some stage, but I just didn't know when. And two of my brothers were already in the family business. so. I suppose they were getting free consultations from me every other <laughs> evening and every other week for years. And um, I left the private practice, which was a very big decision. And I actually went to the public sector for a couple of years. I did four years in a HSE funded project. So if you're talking about transitioning from you know, corporate to country, it was probably a bigger culture shock to have all this paid leave and all this um, time off to going back to the family business where that didn't exist. But I was so glad that I made that decision because um, you need, you ha I had the hard work ethic in me anyway and I couldn't wait to get back. So after 10 years, I joined the family business. Um, at that stage, we've grown from um, you know, a small farm to now actually um, having about 240 staff working with us. We supply potatoes, fruit, vegetables, um, organics to the retail sector nationwide. Uh, so all of the retailers, uh, which are our big customers, we supply to about 100 different lines. So your full produce basket we supply. So although Mead Potato Company, potato is, is, is in the name, we do much, much more. My role within the company is everything files back to figures and numbers and all of that. So I actually let uh, the guys, I have two brothers, one in potatoes, one in fruit and vegetables. I look at the support departments, so the, the, the hidden stuff behind the scenes. I'm business operations manager is my role. And for anyone that's thinking or coming from an agri farm background, you really can go out, get your experience, um, and come back to the business and maybe help it, strengthen it, come back with fresh eyes and a different approach. Um, and I think that's where it benefited both me, the family and the business. Thank you, Eleanor. So just before we hear from Denise O'Callaghan from Denise's Gluten-Free Bakery, one of the things that many of the young people here probably wouldn't remember, but some of the older members of the audience like me would, is that uh, the tradition always was the oldest son got the farm the daughters found a good man and were married off to him. And I see a lady in the back nodding at me. It's true. And the younger people emigrated or went up to the city, which meant Dublin, Cork, Galway or Limerick. The wonderful thing about these stories is it's actually people coming back home. Um, and it's wonderful to hear that Eleanor's now keeping control of her two brothers and whipping them into shape, I'm sure. So Denise, we'd love to hear your story. Yeah, so um, my story is maybe a little bit different. It's a little bit urban, but there's a lot of the same themes between Eleanor and Ronan, actually, it's quite interesting. So um, I have to make a confession. So I joined the Mocker and the Farmer when I was in college, but I was never up close to a cow. This was my enormous secret. And I was dating all these farmers. Was, say, was, it a dating, was that a pre? It was a dating so agency the, in my it, time, yes. It was, it was for the younger people, that was Tinder in those days. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, showing my age now. So myself and three girls from suburbia joined the Mark and the Pharma. The lads didn't know what hit them. We were all high heels and curls. No, no experience at all of cows. And I used to go to my aunt weekends and say, get me near the calves. I need to know stuff about cows fast. You know, anyway. So, um, but um, I suppose I was similar to Eleanor. I grew up in a family where there was family businesses and it was morning, noon, night and day. I now try to glamorize that and say, you know, Estee Lauder talks about lipstick at Sunday dinner and we talk about chocolate cake, but it's not quite the same. But anyway, I try to glamorize it for them. So, um, but, but likewise, when I was, um, you know, heading into university, it was like what to do and you had to do a... Um, a degree that would set you up for the permanent pensionable kind of a job. I would have loved to have done something like um, food science 
Or, but in my day, um, you know, dairy science, I assumed you had to be a farmer or have a, a farm to do it. So I was coming from the other side. So that was all excluded for me for, for the wrong reasons as well. So I did a BA in economics and Italian um, for all the wrong reasons. I, I, I liked speaking Italian, going to the opera, so that seemed very logical. Um, and then I went on and I did um, a, a master's degree in economics. But there were no jobs, the usual. And I knew I wanted to work for myself because I was from the same environment of just family businesses and morning, noon, night and day. And it was that kind of entrepreneurial thing. But anyway, I went to London and um, I started working in investment banking, which was grand. I was doing all the figures and all the rest, but I think I was a bit overly flamboyant for them, really, to be fair. <laughs> I think I scared a lot of bankers in my time. But anyway, so <laughs> I did that for five years and it was grand. But then um, a, a client of ours were in Dublin, they had moved to the IFSC. I'd say I was there around the same time as yourself now, Ronan. And this was an Italian bank. They needed people who spoke Italian and they were Irish. So they were coming back to Ireland. So I went and I worked for them for seven years. That suited me a bit better. Very dramatic. So you could shout and gesticulate a lot. So that was great. <laughs> but I still, I, it kind of wasn't, I knew it wasn't quite right. And I could have done it forever, but I wanted to set up my own gig. And so dad, in the meantime, um, became diagnosed as a celiac. And we were baking at home. We were great home bakers, but this was a new thing for us. Jesus, the whole celiac thing and what did it mean and no gluten and how to bake and la, 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 la. And so mom and my sister and I, just were changing recipes and developing them and all the rest. And then dad and I were powwowing, like Estee Lauder, as you do, and <laughs> um, kind of said, Jesus, there could actually be a gap here. Maybe this is um, an area where you could set up a business, a gluten-free bakery business. But unlike the lads, I didn't have the luxury, I will say, of coming back to a family business. I was the one starting it up. And so I started it from scratch. Um, and we're here now, kind of eight years later, and it has become a family business, but purely because I've sucked them all into it. So um, dad is there every day. I married this unfortunate next door neighbor who could bake and build bakeries. Now he's in, uh, my sister's involved. So they're all, they're all stuck in it now, really. But so a, a family, family business, but from the back door, I suppose, in. So Ronan, going back to you, you, having been away and having been a bit of a renegade in various cities around the world, what, what are the rewards of being back? I mean, all of you have family. What is the, what is the best thing about being home? Being at home. Um, it's, there should be a, a law brought in place, though, as well, for where lads like me have to go away for two or three years because it's only when you go away you realize how valuable what, the little bit you have or the little bit you don't have is at home. Um, it, makes, it broadens your it broadens your, your view of the world. So it was only when I went away that I realized, whoa, um, there's a little asset there at home and there's 100,000 people that live within a radius of us and they all eat chicken. So there has to be some way of getting them to eat some of my chicken. Right. But the biggest benefit of being is just being at home. Um, there's negatives to that as well, but uh, when you'd like to <laughs> vanish for a couple of days. But um, yeah, it's, it's been at home. I've been back in your local community and I'm involved in... Uh, and everything that you should be free to be involved in, that we don't have to be loaded onto a plane and be exported. Um, uh, a lot of people immigrate not through choice, a lot of people immigrate not through choice, but um, to everybody should have the option to come back. They should. And that's a, so tell me, you've, got, you've also developed quite an interesting sideline, which has nothing to do with chickens. So the females in the audience will all know the fashion bloggers, the the recipe bloggers, and so on and so forth. But Ronan I don't has have a, a fashion blog. Ronan has, <laughs> no, he doesn't. Ronan has a new twist. My wife dressed me this morning. <laughs> Ronan, you, 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 develop, you, do, you um, developed a new line of business. Do you want to talk us to us about that? Um, yeah, we, we focus a lot on um, online is big with us. It's the only way we have of getting our, our message out there because we have no real marketing budget. So I suppose I would have been lucky enough. I would have been one of the first farmers on Twitter. And when you're farming... You're on your own, and uh, you have a lot of time to think. So it's a great way of uh, keeping connected with people, but it's also a great way of getting your message out there. So we do a bit of blogging as well, which is, you know, we could do more on it, but um, it all helps to build the profile and get the message out there. And a lot of the, lo I, the reason why I'm up here today, I guarantee, is because of something that I put up two or three years ago and somebody followed it or retweeted it or whatever. Um, 
and we, we do a lot of online sales as well um, at Christmas. It's amazing how things have migrated. Like my mother, I guarantee my mother's probably at home on Facebook now because my daughter's in bed. She minds me the daughter, so she's on. A lot of things happen online now. Um, when we started off, we would have taken all our phone calls, orders for turkeys over the phone. Um, so the phone would have blown up from about the 10th of December to about the 16th of December, and it would just ring out, ring out, ring out, ring out, ring out, take all the orders. In the last two years, three years, the vast majority of that has migrated over to the website. And we don't have any fancy online um, booking thing around that. We have a simple Google Docs form that's made up ourselves. Um, it's easy to do, but even my next door neighbors are now ordering their turkey off me online. And they prefer to do it that way because it's more, it's, it's more efficient for them. And it's, of course, how else would you order it? Or how else would you do something? Or how else would you communicate? So it's become second nature. Uh, but again, there's the slight little problem of uh, lumpy broadband, we'll call it. There in the morning, not there in the afternoon. It's like bad porridge. You use it because you're hungry, but uh, you'd much rather have nicer porridge. So... So one of the themes today is about enabling rural Ireland to okay. enhance employment opportunities. You see connectivity as a major Oh, it's vital. If we, if we had better connectivity in the morning, um, or if around us had better connectivity in the morning, there'd be more jobs. Definitely, because we'd, like, I'd have a few more ideas floating around my head that might never see the light of day, but one of them involves better connectivity. Um, and like even simple thing like all our invoices and everything we do, my entire accounts package is online. It's all in the uh, cloud, I, I hope. <laughs> Whatever the cloud is, but it's up there anyway with a load of rain. But um, everything is, but some, some days, some Mondays, we can't actually process our invoices because we don't have fast enough broadband or it just dies. And it is a fantastic pain. So if people like me, and I guarantee if people get better connectivity to broadband, there'll be a lot more jobs in rural Ireland. And it sounds kind of like a very fancy, highfalutin thing to say, oh, connectivity is key, and I don't know what bandwidth is. I don't barely know what connectivity is, but I don't understand electricity either, but I need it. Yeah. And um, if we get better broadband, there will be more jobs in rural Ireland. Well, we were uh, discussing this, Ronan and I, earlier, and this morning, uh, AIR announced the next 200 villages and towns around the country that we're bringing high-speed broadband to. And luckily for me, Athen Rye was on the list. So um, we're delighted. My father is currently at home digging a trench <laughs> <laughs> to bring the cable in from the road. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, Eleanor, in terms of the rewards, I mean, you've become a mum since you went back. Sorry, what was that? What, what is it like yeah, for you being I back at home? It's a good work-life balance as well as everything else. But um, what I found was great is, I mean, there's 230,000 jobs in the agri-food sector. And I think people need to know that it's so much more than what they might typically think. Exactly. Because I'm recruiting on a daily, weekly basis due to growth. And we're ensuring that we're trying to employ local where we can. Um, work where you live. I'm working um, with the Mead Enterprise Board on that. Work where you live because we have fantastic talent in our area that can have that work-life balance without having to go to Dublin, without having to go further afield. So it's just trying to nurture that and thankfully we have fantastic recruits. You know we have quality is probably the biggest part of our game and making sure that quality is king, that everything that we provide to the retailers is of top class. So we have a massive team in the quality end of things, and that's all food science, food science degrees, and so on. And again, we're nurturing the local talents that have gone to UCD, DIT, DKIT, and bringing them on uh, on graduate programs with ourselves. And um, there's the whole maintenance. I mean, without our, our factory, could not be a standstill for a second. We can't have breakdown. So we have a team of maintenance team so anyone again that's into electricals or anything like that again it still goes back to agri-food there is jobs there and yeah. um, we have an accounts team we have IT um, public relations marketing and so on so there's huge huge uh, potential within the agri-food sector for somebody that has maybe you know a different maybe it's not on the farm like agronomy maybe it's not the typical farm 
um, you know, jobs that they're thinking of. But there is definitely jobs there. And in terms of reward, it's great to see those people going on well within our company, progressing maybe up to management level and so on. And I think that's, uh, that's what, it, what it's all about as well for, 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 for us. Absolutely. And Denise, final words of wisdom for the audience? Yeah, I know it's the, it's the same as, as what Eleanor is, is um, stating there. I mean, Cork is very good for food businesses. It, I suppose it's the gateway to food, really. But I suppose food businesses or any business will have all the same categories. You will have an accounting department. You will have a marketing group. You will have PR. You'll have sales. So, you know, you might think, God, you'd make a good salesman. But it doesn't necessarily have to be selling Massey Ferguson or forklifts or whatever. You know, you could be selling gluten-free cakes in the Middle East, you know. I mean, and it can be very interesting and glamorous and it's kind of an easy sell in a way because we're all involved in food you know whether it's chickens or turkeys or potatoes or you know cake you know everybody uh is can relate to it so it's a much easier way i suppose it's a much uh more tangible thing to sell or to get involved in um so and i i would also echo what elner has said in terms of placements i did no placements in university and i really felt that i came out and i was very green and i had no idea what working you know in a, a, a proper office work environment was like and certainly you think god i'd love that now and then you get involved and you think sweet jesus this isn't for me at all so um we would have very much set ourselves up as a teaching bakery um, and we encourage a lot of students to come in, in uh, particularly now on the food science side, on the quality side, on the sales marketing PR. We do a lot with um, UCC and UCD in terms of that, just to get in and give people a hands-on experience of this is what it's like in a food business out there, you know. So I think if, if students have that opportunity, they should take them. It certainly helps you to pin down your choices and to know what, what's of most interest to you. Great. So... Um, I think just a couple of key messages. Number one, from all four of us, um, and, and I would have had the same experience, um, it really is about not allowing things to limit. It, it, one of the things as a HR leader that frustrates me more than anything is when we interview young people and they believe that there are limits. There are no limits. We're Irish. We're hugely marketable globally. In any American technology company I've worked with, um, I was always delighted to see um, Irish colleagues. Um, being Irish opens up a huge opportunity for you across the globe. You have to live it to experience it. The last thing is for the young people in the room, get work experience. AIR is launching its first ever internship program this summer and we will be bringing in around the country about 50 young people to show them what life at work is and as we say what life at, on AIR is like. And finally, listen to the call to home. Um, I know I've gone out and come back and gone out and come back and, and as I've said to a number of my colleagues at AIR, my mother, bless her, finally feels like I've got a proper job because I'm at home and she can tell her friends about it and she can tell who I work for. So on behalf of all of us, we wish every one of you, especially the young people in the audience, huge success with your careers. No, no limits. Um, because every one of you has an individual story you're about to write. And I see a number of mothers in the audience, and I think Irish mammies are the best. Ronan's mammy, mine, Denise's, and Eleanor's. Continue to encourage your children to push the limits, because there are no limits when you're Irish and when you have a desire to, to succeed. So thank you for your time, and um, we'll talk to you again soon.